So onto the abdominals, and as most of you are probably aware, our industry is very much focused on flexing abdominals. Uh, abdominal muscles contract to flex the spine, everybody knows that, and so we've got a world of flexion, 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 uh, which is designed to give us a six pack, an eight pack, and it's all mirror muscle aesthetic. The abdominals are all about stability and bracing, but we, we, when we look at how the abdominals move, you get an idea that it's not about stability, it's about mobility, um, and critically, it's about when the flexion should take place in our movement, not about flexing. Uh, so you can see there's a different uh, time frame on that. And if I turn Chris sideways, obviously uh, we're, we're grouping muscles together. So we're, we're grouping the rectus abdominis, we're also grouping the internal oblique and the external oblique um, as this kind of canvas that crosses the front of the abdomen and is there to decelerate the spine in its journeys away from centre, but also to, de to decelerate the movement of the rib cage where the attachments are, and also the pelvis as well. With gravity in mind, the abdominal, the role of the abdominals changes completely. The, the, the abdominal, abdominals are designed to protect any extension of the spine here and not to go around in a flexed way. So, ironically, we flex, flex, flex. When we get upright in flexion, of course, if I just get you to, to flex again, then I put my fingers in the abdomen and it is, it is, sorry to say, soft as shit. And there's nothing here other than his back muscles, which are suddenly decelerating the flexion, holding him up. Listen to the difference when I extend his spine. We got a nice drum skin, nice tight tone of the muscle of the, of the abdomen. So what if we stopped flexing and started extending as a way of understanding our abdominals better? But there is a three-dimensional component to it. We'll go through sagittal plane. So again, we've got um, the attachment site on the pelvis. So in the sagittal plane, there are a couple of options here. We can anterior tilt the pelvis, and we can posterior tilt the pelvis. One shortens posterior tilt, one lengthens anterior tilt. And, and so perhaps in order to be in a neutral position, we need our pelvis to be somewhere in between the two. To be in between the two means that I can anterior tilt to create length and posterior tilt back to create shortening in my gait cycle. Anterior tilt and posterior tilt are critical movements during our movement patterns. And on the attachment side up at the rib, similar to what we saw in the psoas, if I get some extension in the spine, extension in the thoracics and a lift of the rib cage, possibly an inhalation as well to get that diaphragmatic breathing in place that gives load to the muscles and couple that with an anterior tilt and I get a huge amount of lengthening in the sagittal plane uh, of, of the abdomen and to, we'll look at the opposite movement as well as he comes out of that. Now we start to get a nice flexion in the spine, some posterior tilt and the abdomen is shortening. So your rectus abdominis is shortening both sides of the obliques as well. So we've got our internal oblique on the left and our external oblique on the left will shorten. In fact, it's, a, it's obviously a bilateral thing. So our spinal flexion gets both oblique sets shortening towards each other and the rectus shortening towards uh, each other as the rib cage and the pelvis close. Let's pop Chris in the frontal plane, straight at him. Um, now, the, this time, the, the sagittal plane is more of a bilateral kind of approach. So a single flexion will shorten the tissues on both sides. This is definitely a unilateral approach when we break it down into the frontal plane. So if we look at this side abdomen, we've got the rectus, which is close to the spine, so less of a lever. And then we've got the internal and external oblique on the outside as well. Um, so a, a bigger lever, in, in essence, to decelerate the movement of the spine. We've got two things again. We've got the attachment site at the pelvis, the attachment site on the rib cage. If I put Chris's left arm up in the air and ask him to reach high again, you'll notice that what's happened, his rib cage tilts, laterally flexing his spine to the right and his, the tissues on the left-hand side lengthen and the tissues on the right-hand side shorten. Bring the arm down a second. Just go back to here. I can also, if I just get him to bend his left knee, which will drop the pelvis, I get the length again in the uh, obliques on the left hand side and definitely as well some small amount of length happening on the left hand side in the rectus abdominis too. So this um, drop coupled with this rise will give us our biggest frontal plane stretch. So the key is to know when is that happening in the gait cycle and can our patients access that in order to get abdominal load in the frontal plane. I can mix the two planes together. So if I start an anterior tilt and a rib cage, posterior tilt or lift coupled here, then I'm now stretching in the sagittal plane and the frontal plane. Okay. And then if we move that into the transverse plane and just break it down, 
Uh, again, obviously we have the external oblique and the internal oblique, which, if you're not sure, I always think about pockets. So my external trouser pockets is the, the fibres of my external oblique, and my internal trouser jacket pocket, even, um, actually creates the fibres for the, the internal. So here we've got the internal oblique fibres and the external oblique fibres. But when I go into a rotation, I'm gonna, you can see the T-shirt create the length through, through the abdomen. This is the internal oblique on the left lengthening and the external oblique on the right lengthening. While on the opposite side, the external oblique here and the internal oblique here are shortening together. So there's a cross relationship between the two. Now, how do we get this to happen? Three things. One is a spinal rotation to the right. Two is a rib cage rotation to the right. That should happen together, obviously. But also a rotation to the left Bend that right knee again. A rotation to the left of the pelvis as well. So let's, in fact, if I just put your right leg forward, then we've got, as he bends his knee, he should drive his pelvis away from that lead leg. And then imagine his hand walking, reaching forward, will create a rotation of the rib cage at the same time. Now, if your clients are not getting a rotation to the right in the rib cage and a rotation to the left, in the pelvis, then they are not getting uh, oblique abdominal and internal oblique load. At the same time, perhaps they should be getting some extension to get some sagittal plane load, and perhaps they should be getting some hip drop in order to get some frontal plane load as well. That's a three-dimensional load that happens critically in a moment of gait um, in order to manage the spine and the pelvis's journey through every step we take.